Hello again and welcome to another Warhammer 40k Mordian Glory video. In today's episode, we shall be casting our ever critical eye over the new index for the guard in 10th edition. And we will be asking and answering one simple question. Which is the best big badass tank of the guard? That's right. It's time for another super heavy showdown, baby. And so without further ado, let's get ready to unleash 11 barrels of hell and all guardsmen. Follow me to glory! Okay, so now that we've all calmed down and I've stopped screaming Dawn of War 1 Baneblade quotes down the microphone, let's get into today's video. And the first thing that we are going to do is start off by looking at the shared profile of each of the Super Heavies. You see, whether you're taking a Hellhammer, a Doomhammer, or a Shadow Sword, all of the guard big tanks now share the exact same profile. This is a small change from the 9th edition codex where you had some of the variants which basically had more wounds and some variants which had less wounds. All of that's gone away now and the profile has been completely standardized regardless of which big tank you decide to take. Essentially, kind of like how it was when I did the Lehman Russ video, and if you've not seen the episode, I'll make sure to link it at the end of this one. The main differences between the different Super Heavies comes down to the main cannon and their ability. However, with the Guard Big Tanks, there is a couple of additional factors we need to take into account. Some of them do get a whole mounted Demolisher Cannon, so I'll make sure to point out which ones those are. And also, some of them do have a carrying capacity. That's right, they can act as a transport. And, of course, it goes without saying, but each one of these variants does have its own unique points cost that we need to take into account. But don't worry. Rest assured, all of these different factors and details have been taken into account, and they are what have determined where I'm ranking each one of these Super Heavies. But now, before we get into the differences, let's take a look at the similarities, starting with that shared profile that I mentioned earlier. So each one of the Super Heavies has got a 9-inch movement that is slightly less than the average in your guard multiple. Most vehicles do have a 10-inch movement, but I don't know if it's going to be massively impactful. Yes, Movement is key in any game of 40k, but 9 inches, 10 inches, I think maybe you'll wish you had the extra inch. I mean, <laughs> don't we all? But I think in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to be massively impactful, but it's just something to be aware of. You do only go 9 inches a turn. Then we get on to the defensive profile, and each one of the Super Heavies has got toughness 13 which is really really nice it means that the most common anti-tank weapon that you're likely to encounter the las cannon and its equivalent is going to wound you on fives i've spoken at length about how being toughness 12 is a big deal for the rogal dawn so you can imagine how much better it is being t13 on a super heavy combine that with a two plus armor save and an eye watering 24 wounds and you have a vehicle which is extremely durable your opponent is going to need to concentrate a lot of anti-tank firepower and even if they do they're probably also going to need a really really good ability like oath of moment to target and destroy you but frankly there are a lot of factions which just don't have the tools for dealing with something like a guard super heavy. Sure, you've got the Eldar and you've got some of the other top factions that'll probably blast through it in a turn, but once you get out of that top three, top five sort of tier and start looking at a lot of the mid board, the factions that are rocking between 40 and 50% win rate or lower, many of them just don't quite have the anti-tank concentration that they need to get rid of one of these things in a turn. So the good thing about a lot of the new guard super heavies from my experience, and I've used them in at least half a dozen battles now, many of which have been covered in battle reports on this channel, is they tend to last more than a turn. 
which if you're a ninth edition or earlier veteran is music to your ears because it, there was nothing more disheartening than putting your big awesome centerpiece model down on the table and it just getting blasted off i'm not saying they're going to get to the end of the game i'm not saying that they're invincible they're not like anything in 40k if you really want it dead it will die but what I am saying is they're highly durable and for a lot of armies it's going to take a turn or two or maybe even three before this thing goes down. And rounding out the profile we've got a leadership of seven which is a little, a little bad. These things are meant to be crewed by the most veteran tankers so it would have been nice to see a leadership of six but it's hard to complain when pretty much every unit has got leadership seven in the guard. It's just standardized. And then it's got an objective control of eight which is not insignificant. If an enemy unit of Terminators holding an objective, this thing can take it off them quite comfortably. So OC of A, not great, not terrible. Definitely something that you could use to sneak an objective away in a pinch. But now let's move on to the shared weapon systems of these tanks. What do they all have in common? Well, each one comes with one twin heavy bolter, and then you get as standard a set of sponsors. And each one of these sponsors comes with another twin heavy bolter and a las cannon. So in total, you'll have two las cannons and two more twin heavy bolters. And the heavy bolters can be swapped out for twin heavy flamers. In addition, for the low, low cost of three, you can take another set of sponsors. So basically, you're always going to take the extra sponsors because there's literally no downside for doing so. In reality, the shared weapons are one twin heavy bolter, four las cannons, and four twin heavy bolters, which can also be swapped out for twin heavy flamers. And just to be clear, those are all standard issue heavy bolters and las cannons. We're not seeing anything wacky like a Cognis las cannon or anything like that. Each last cannon fires one shot, 48 inch range, ballistic skill 4 plus, strength 12, AP minus 3, D6 plus 1 damage. And each twin heavy bolter has sustained hits 1, twin linked, 36 inch range, 3 shots, ballistic skill 4 plus, strength 5, AP minus 1, 2 damage. And in case you do swap them out for the twin heavy flamers, they each have ignores cover, torrent, twin linked, 12 inch range, D6 shots. No ballistic skill because they hit automatically. Strength 5, AP minus 1, and 1 damage. Just a quick side note, if you're a newer player and you're not certain whether you want the heavy bolters or the heavy flamers, my go-to across every edition has always been the heavy bolters. At the end of the day, even though it's a very big, amazing unit, your super heavies are still guard tanks. And guard tanks tend to do fire support. And to do that, they need to be able to fire and shoot and be able to just dacker down the enemy you want to keep your opponent at arm's length you don't want him getting up close and personal with your super heavy because frankly they have very limited close combat capabilities and if they start getting into combat with you it's just gonna just be a massive pain in the bum so basically go for the heavy bolters it's pretty much addition proof there may be the occasional time when all the heavy flamers is technically better or there's a niche use for them but by and large, spamming them heavy bolters and going for maximum DACA tends to be the safer option if you're building your super heavy. But speaking of meagre close combat capabilities, it's worth mentioning in passing that each super heavy has armored tracks and this gives it six attacks in close combat, weapon skill four plus, strength eight, AP zero, damage one. Really, not all that much to write home about. If you're lucky, you'll run over a Termagon or two. But yeah, this thing is not designed for close combat. Gone are the days when your Baneblade could defeat a Corn Bloodthirst in combat. 08th edition, how we miss you. But that covers all of the commonalities. Now let's get to the differences. And this is where we're going to begin ranking the different super heavies and coming in last place is one of my favorite guard super heavies so this is kind of sad it was actually the first one that i ever built myself it is the hellhammer i know i know that's going to be sad for a lot of people to hear i know a lot of people have a soft spot in their heart for the old hellhammer 
But unfortunately, guys, it's just pretty bloody terrible. It does have a coaxial auto cannon, so that's nice. And it does have a demolisher cannon as well. Ooh, very tasty. But then you get to the main event. Once you get past all the window dressing, you get to the main thing. The big cannon. The Hellhammer cannon. Unfortunately, it's a massive letdown. Firstly, it's only got a 30-inch range. That is ridiculously short range for a weapon like this. That means that between that and the Demolisher Cannon, which has only got a 24-inch range, you're going to have to expose this vehicle. You're going to have to get it up close to really start getting the angles you need to start doing the damage. Even on the smaller 10th edition boards, those ranges are lackluster. And when you finally do get it into range, it fires 4d6 shots. So maybe you get 24 shots, or maybe you finally get the angle and you roll four ones and you get four shots and your tank does nothing. And it's gonna do nothing if it rolls badly because it's only got strength seven, AP minus one, two damage. It's not like, ooh, it's 46, but every single one of those shots is a bunker buster. No, it's a big Lehman Russ Eradicator. And my Eradicator is, you know, viable because it's so cheap. It's one of the cheapest Russ variants. The Hellhammer is one of the most expensive Baneblade variants coming in at 510 points. So you've got a big price tag with a lackluster main weapon. In fact, the things that are most attractive about this tank are the accoutrement, the demolisher and the autocan and all the other weapons you can strap onto it. But really, salt in the wound, what really kicks it whilst it's down, is the close quarters warfare ability. This is its unique thing, its USP. This model does not suffer the penalty to hit rolls for making ranged attacks whilst enemy units are within engagement range of it. Now that might seem okay. I mean, when I was talking about the Lehman Russ Eradicator and Demolisher, having this ability was really good for them, right? Well, that's because they had an extra layer to their rule. Not only could they shoot into combat without penalty when engagement range, but they could also shoot their main weapons into combat, even though they were blast. Now, I might be about to make a fool of myself, and if I am, please lambast me down in the comment section and correct me. But I have checked the core rules. I've gone through it carefully, and I've even controlled F and Search Titanic. And I have found nothing that gives Titanic units the exemption of being able to shoot blast weapons into the combat they're in, into engagement range. So what this means is that the Hellhammer, which is a super heavy version of your tanks, has a worse unique ability than that of a Lehman Russ, one of our smaller fire support units. It's a joke. So let us not dwell on the follies of the Hellhammer any longer. Let us pull ourselves out of the mud and take a tentative step up the ladder and look at the next Super Heavy, which is the Doom Hammer. Sadly, it seems like a lot of the Super Heavies with Hammer in their name aren't doing so hot in 10th edition, and the Doom Hammer is no exception. Its main weapon is the Magma Cannon. And I have to admit here, I have never really been a fan of the magma cannon i've never really found it to be very effective in almost any edition and i've tried to leave my bias at the door and just base the weapon on its merits but just looking at it it's not very impressive it has a 24 inch range which is already pretty bloody abysmal and then it is blast with melter six so it's basically a giant melter cannon and if you get it within half range then you get the melter six it has D6 plus three attacks, which is really low. It's really, really low. Considering that's the same as, again, what a Lehman Russ can get with most of its weapon options, it seems kind of pathetic to have this on a Super Heavy. It's kind of similar to the Hellhammer, right? It's just got a different version of the Lehman Russ gun. Well, this one's just got the same number of shots as the Lehman Russ cannon. It's underwhelming, to say the least. It's strength 12, which is okay. But considering this is meant to be a Titan killer, as you'll see later on, strength 12 ain't going to cut the mustard. That ain't going to do it. It means that against your intended target, you're wounding it on fives. And against other super heavies, you're wounding on fives. If you shoot a Doomhammer, 
at another Imperial Guard Super Heavy, you're wounding on fives. Even if you shoot it against more common Super Heavies like Knights, you're wounding them on fours. And as we've mentioned many times before, I talked about this in the Rogal Dawn video, I keep referring back to it. If you're wounding a tank on fours, that's not reliable because you know you're not going to get that four up when you really need it. So unfortunately, the Doom Hammers number of shots is lackluster the range is unimpressive the strength is mediocre and it's ap minus four which is okay but you'll see there's much better weapons with better ap than that in the other super heavies and then it has a very swingy d6 damage now that d6 damage is somewhat mitigated by the fact that it has a special rule called close range titan killer each time this model's magma cannon targets an enemy monster or vehicle unit, that target is always considered to be within half range of that weapon. Basically, when you're shooting it at not a vehicle or monster, it's D6 damage. When you're shooting it at a vehicle or monster, it's D6 plus 6. Whilst that might seem decent at first glance, for me, it makes the vehicle just a little bit too specialized. And I guess my overall problem with the Doomhammer is... It just doesn't feel like it does anything particularly well. Its main gun gets outshone by other super heavies, which are dedicated at killing tanks. And then it has a transport capacity of 26 Ashman at Arm infantry. But then you've got other super heavies, which have a greater transport capacity. And I can't help but feel like if I was to spend the 455 points that I was going to spend on a Doomhammer, I could take those points and get two Chimeras and some other vehicles which are going to do the same amount of transport capacity and also bring the same amount of firepower to the table. It just it just doesn't seem very good to me. So overall, I'm just not impressed by the Doomhammer. Main weapon, let down. Ability, let down. Transport capacity, nothing to write home about. That's why it's basically bottom of the pile. The only reason that it's not the very bottom is because you can essentially kill vehicles with it in 10th edition and bear in mind that this is the edition where things are getting increasingly more mechanized something that has got more anti-tank potential is going to be better than the hellhammer which has got no anti-tank potential now this next super heavy makes me sad because it is the iconic one it is the classic it is the quintessential guard mega tank and to see it laid so low when it looked so promising in ninth just makes a single manly tear roll down my cheek. I am talking about the Bane Blade. It is the Bane Blade, yes! But sadly, it's not yes, it's no. The Bane Blade has some things going for it, and on paper, it does seem semi viable. So to start off, you've got the Bane Blade Cannon, which has got a 72 inch range. Nice. That means we can sit back, we can blast away, have a good time, get the angles we need without having to overly expose ourselves. Awesome. It's strength 12, it's AP minus 2, and it's 3 damage. That's like the Oppressor Cannon. And I love the Oppressor Cannon on the Dawn. Yeah, amazing. Then we get to the first stumbling block. The number of attacks is 3d6. Now, yeah, it has Blast, so that does mitigate its swinging somewhat. But like the Hellhammer, that's just too much of a casino. That's too much of a wild card. I might end up getting my Super Heavy on the perfect angle, line everything up, do everything right, and then I just roll dog shit on the number of dice, and I'm punished for something that's completely out of my control. It just doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem right. So... The 3D6 is a big, fat, stinky on the Bane Blade. Now, it does come with the Coaxial Auto Cannon, and it does come with the Demolish Cannon, like the Hellhammer. So that is nice. It is a bit more firepower. But unfortunately, it doesn't make up for its kind of rubbish ability. Rolling Fortress. Each time a range attack is allocated to an Ashmanitar model from your army, if that model is not fully visible to every enemy model in the attacking unit because of this Baneblade model, that model has the benefit of cover against that attack. Now on paper, that seems really cool. And if 10th edition terrain had evolved so where we had, you know, boards that are a little bit more open, I think Rolling Fortress could have had play. But unfortunately, 
in reality, it does very little. Because this is 10th edition. The boards are incredibly packed with terrain. They're unbelievably dense. And so in a competitive environment, pretty much every unit is either hidden out of line of sight or is benefiting from cover anyway from some kind of ruin that's being shot over or some kind of battlefield debris. So the Baneblade is a bit meh. It's got a very swingy gun. It's got an ability that doesn't really mean anything. But hey, it's got a lot of firepower, right? So why is it so far down? Well, the thing that I think kills it, and the thing that I think makes it pretty unviable outside of 3,000 point or apocalypse sized games, is its points cost. It is a staggering 540 points. It is the most expensive variant. And I'm sorry, but if I'm going to be paying more than 25% of my total army points in a 2,000 point game, on one vehicle, I kind of expect its ability to be amazing and its weapon to be bloody reliable. Long story short, you're just not getting what you're paying for. Okay, so that covers the bottom three super heavies and they're the ones that if you include them in your list, you're more than likely actively handicapping yourself. They're either too expensive to the point where they're taking away and you're gonna have to cut corners elsewhere, or they're just a bit rubbish. The next couple of super heavies we're gonna look at are viable. They're not great, they're not terrible. I'm not saying by putting them in your list they're gonna be some kind of wonder waffen, but you can at least put them in your army and not feel like you're letting the side down. And the first one of these decent super heavies is the Bane Hammer. Who knew if you took the crap Hell Hammer and combined it with the underwhelming Bane Blade that two negatives would actually make a positive? Its Tremor Cannon is actually pretty decent. It has a 36 inch range, which makes it just long enough range to count as a proper fire support unit in my mind. And it fires 2d6 plus three shots. Finally, a reliable number. And those shots are at strength 12, A for minus two, damage three, which like the oppressor cannon is a really solid profile, but unlike the Baneblade cannon, it's a lot less swingy because the Baneblade could roll triple one and you get three shots. If you roll badly on the Tremor cannon, you're still gonna get a minimum of five, but your average is actually the same as the Baneblade. So it's just a much more reliable weapon and that makes me sleep a little bit easier at night. And it also has a all right ability as well. Not great, not terrible. It's Tremor Quake. In your shooting phase, just after selecting a target for this model's Tremor Cannon, the target unit and every other enemy infantry unit within three inches of that unit must take a battle shock test. What I like about this is you don't have to wait to see if you hit or wound anyone. It's the moment that you target them. This gives it great anti-stratagem play because you get to target your opponent then because you're the controller player, you decide in which order things happen. So you say, right, I'm going to make you take the Battleshock test first before you react to any stratagems. If they fail their Battleshock test, then they can't use stratagems on that unit. If you're facing off against something like Custodes, who can be an absolute nightmare with strats, being able to potentially Battleshock them and other units around them could, in certain circumstances, could flip the game your way. However, I do think it's important not to oversell this too much. Battleshock in general isn't hugely impactful in 10th edition, so anything that kind of relates to it or builds upon it is, by association, not the greatest thing in the world. It's fine, it's niche, it might pop off here and there, but don't be surprised if Tremor Quake doesn't do very much in most of your games. A couple of last things to mention about the Bane Hammer is that it has a transport capacity of 26 and a fine deck of 12, which is fine. But as I mentioned with the Doom Hammer, you shouldn't be thinking of these things as transports. They're a big tank. They should be smashing the enemy. Any transport capacity you get is kind of a nice to have. One of the main drawbacks of the Bane Hammer is unfortunately its points cost. It does cost 490. Whilst that's not the most expensive, it's also not the cheapest. And so it, I kind of wish it was 10 or 15 points cheaper. If it was there, 
I might bump it up a slot or two in the list. But as it is, it's a little expensive, but hell, it is the first of the super heavies that we've seen that at least is somewhat reliable. Its gun is okay, and its ability actually has some use. Another decent super heavy, and next on our list is the Stormlord. This is everyone's favorite DACA tank, and its USP is it is the biggest bullet hose in the guard. And it does this with its main weapon, the Vulcan Mega Bolter. It has sustained hits one, a 48 inch range, 20 shots, strength six, AP minus one, and damage two. Because of its sustained hits, on average, it's actually going to get 23 shots in a turn, which is pretty nice. And when you compare this to the Hellhammer, you realize why the Hellhammer is so terrible. Because the Hellhammer has a very similar profile. Strength 7, Strength 6, they're pretty much the same for the majority of circumstances you're going to enter. Except for the Vulcan Mega Bolter has longer range. And its average number of shots because of sustained hits is almost as much as the maximum shots that the Hellhammer Cannon is going to put out with its blast. So there's just no comparison here. And hopefully you can now see why the Hellhammer is so low when you start stacking up against one of its direct competitors, which is the Stormlord. A cool thing about the Stormlord is that it also gets two free heavy stubbers. And these shouldn't be overlooked because between them, when they get within rapid fire range, they're actually pumping out 12 additional shots. That's nothing to turn your nose up at. And this gets even better when you start thinking about the amount of guys that can shoot out the back of this thing. Because unlike the Bane Hammer and the Doom Hammer, which I've only got a transport capacity of 26, which can be easily matched using a couple of Chimeras. The Stormlord has an amazing carrying capacity of 40 Ashton Militarm infantry models. Now you might be thinking, Morning Glory, you, you said that these things shouldn't be considered as transports. You should be considering them as tanks. That is true, and you should be thinking of them as, as tanks. But the Stormlord does something unique with its transport capacity. A, it's really big. To try and match that with Chimeras, you're going to need four Chimeras. That is going to cost you 340 points. And that's the majority of the cost of the Stormlord. So unlike something like a Bane Hammer or Doom Hammer, whose carrying capacity can be emulated very cheaply, and so therefore they shouldn't be considered as transports, the Stormlord actually can be considered as one because to try and emulate it is going to cost you a lot of points. You're not really going to save anything by going elsewhere. On top of this, it has a really generous firing deck. 24 models can shoot out of the top. So not only can it have a lot of people inside, but also you can really enhance its firepower with such a massive firing deck. Don't forget any models that are embarked will benefit from any orders that the Stormlord receives because of the way the firing deck works. It counts as being equipped with their weapons. So if you tell it to take aim, basically all those LAS cannons and heavy bolts and other things that you want to stack in the back, all those Ogryn, they're also going to get the take aim. So it's a really, really good firing deck. It's a really good transport capacity and it does something unique that you can't get elsewhere. But wait, there's more because the Stormlord has another thing that enhances its whole transport shtick, and that is the mount up ability. At the end of your opponent's movement phase, if there's no models in the Stormlord, and you've got a unit that is within six inches of the Stormlord, and it's not an engagement range, it can jump in back in the transport. That's right, you can drive up your Stormlord, you can jump out, you can shoot, and then when your opponent in their turn tries to counterattack you, you can go, see you later, shitlord, and jump back inside your big tank. It's really cool. And you might think, well, why would I want to get out? Why wouldn't I just want to stay in the transport and shoot? Think about this in terms of Scions. Scions don't get to use their Stormtroopers' ability when they're inside of Stormlord. But they do get to use it when they jump out. Now, normally you jump out and then you sort of sat there, you just get killed and, oh, that's great. You did a few rerolls, but you died. With the Stormlord, what you can do is you can have your Stormlord drive up, your Scions jump out, suddenly they're out of the vehicle, they can start using Stormtroopers. That means that if you have a 15-man brick of Scions, 10 Scions and a Scion Command Squad, that's a lot of special weapons that are getting the full rerolls to clear the objective. And then you just get back in the transport free of charge and you are having a great time. So 
not only is the Stormlord bringing a huge amount of firepower to the table, not only is that firepower better than other super heavies that you can get, but also it actually has a unique transport angle and has a lot of things that build on that to make it legitimate as an assault transport. But wait, I hear you cry. If the Stormlord is so good, why isn't it on the top of your list, Mordian? It doesn't seem to have any disadvantages. Well, unfortunately, there is one teeny tiny issue. It's an anti-infantry vehicle. That's what its main gun does. And 10th edition does seem to be becoming more and more mechanized, more and more vehicle based. And so there is a chance that you take your Stormlord, it's got all this firepower, but it just spends a lot of the game just scratching the paint of the enemy tanks. So it is good, and it's got a very competitive price point as well at 460. You can definitely include that without breaking the bank. But it might struggle in the meta of vehicles. So we've covered the bad super heavies, and we've covered the all right super heavies, but now we're entering the top three. The next units we're gonna look at are all good. You can include them in your army, and you will enhance your list. All of these can be considered somewhat competitive. Super Heavies have always been a little bit hit and miss on the tournament scene, but each one of these units I have seen crop up, not only in battle reports on some more competitive channels, but also I've used them myself and had great results from them. And finally, I've actually seen them appear here and there on tournament reports. Things like Meta Monday and some of the tournament results on BCP. There have been guard lists that have featured these units and they've done all right at events. Claiming the bronze medal is the true premier anti-vehicle super heavy. The real Titan killer. None of this poor imitation that the Doomhammer attempts. I am, of course, talking about the Shadow Sword. Possibly the most famous, or should I say infamous, of the Guard Super Heavies, the Shadow Sword is equipped with the intimidating Volcano Cannon. This weapon has a 96 inch range, making it the longest range of all of the Guard Big Tanks. It also fires D3 plus 1 shots. That might seem a little bit low, but it does have the blast special rule giving it extra shots against infantry which does mitigate the low number a bit and it also has heavy which helps mitigate its ballistic skill of four plus remember that heavy and the take aim order do stack so your shadow sword can hit on a two plus and when it does hit it hurts it has a 24 strength weapon unless you are an enemy super heavy you are being wounded on twos. And even if you are a super heavy, even if you're a knight, even if you are a titan, it's wounding you on threes. And you better have an invulnerable save because it's AP minus five. It's cutting through all armor. And it is an incredible, just, oh my God, 12 damage. I think that might be the highest damage weapon in the guard index. It's the highest damage weapon I'm aware of in 40k, although there might be something that does more. But yeah, 12 damage. Every shot. That'll play. Statistically, when you shoot a Shadow Sword, it should kill an Imperial Knight. Because you get an average of three shots, and it will hit with three of them. Hit on twos, we only ones, thanks to Heavy Take Aim and, well, a Scout Sentinel. And then it's going to wound on twos so even if between the hits and the wounds you drop one of your shots and then knight has a five as invulnerable save so statistically it's not going to pass those and so it takes 24 damage and it dies so this thing is a knight killer it does just cut them in half no problems asked and also it has a really really cool special rule titan killer each time this model makes a ranged attack with its volcano cannon that targets a monster or vehicle unit, 
that attack has a devastating wounds ability. So even if that knight player does rotate iron shields, there's a chance you just roll that six and just slam 12 mortal wounds right down his throat. But the cherry on top, the best bit, is the points cost. You guys know I'm a sucker for a deal. You know I like a bargain. And so, despite the fact that the Shadow Sword has got a ludicrously powerful weapon, despite the fact that it's kind of anti-meta, because knights are all over the tournament scene and 10th is becoming more vehicle-based, as we've said, GW has pointed the Shadow Sword at only 440 points. It is, in fact, the cheapest super heavy you can take. What's kind of wild is there is a genuinely, like, legitimate list that just involves two of these things. Why mess around with all sorts of Lehman Russes and Rogal Dawns and Hydras and other kind of tanks when you could just slap two Shadow Swords in your list and then spend the rest of your points on artillery and infantry? It kind of makes sense. They're actually affordable. It's less than a thousand points to bank two of them in your list. Why wouldn't you do it? So it's really, really, really good that it's so cheap. It makes it very accessible. It makes it genuinely good. It means if it dies, you don't completely handicap yourself. You haven't lost half your army. And I think the reason GW's pointed it so low is because it is very specialized. It's not the top tank because if you do come across a horde army, and bear in mind, Nids are one of the starter armies in 10th, so there's going to be a lot of termagants flying around the place. If you do come across a swarm, you're going to be relying upon the accoutrement, upon the support fire, upon the heavy bolters and other things that this thing can take. So it's very, very, very good at killing tanks in a tank meta, but it is going to let you down a bit against hordes, and that's why it's in the top three, but it's not at the very top. But now we get to the final two, and this was really, really difficult. This was harder than trying to pick between the final two for the Lehman Russes. Because honestly, both of these deserve to be in the top slot. And you could consider them joint first. But for the sake of this video, I will pick one to be second and one to be first. And the one that's going to claim the silver medal is going to be the Bane Sword. Now, this was the best Super Heavy back in 9th edition and it was pretty pretty good it definitely uh did a lot of damage and so it's a pleasant surprise to see that it's still viable intent if you're one of those people that listened to me in the old edition and bought yourself a bane sword well praise be it's still very 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 potent now the big thing about the bane sword is it comes with the quake cannon this is blast and ignores cover and it has a 72 inch range. So it's got the range, it's got the blast to help it deal with infantry and it even ignores cover. It has D6 plus six shots. So that's really, really reliable. And with the blast, when you, unlike the Shadow Sword, when you come across infantry, this thing is just never gonna let you down. It can kill all targets with that volume of shots. It's also strength 16. So when I say it can kill any target, vehicles, infantry, it's got the strength to get it done. Even though the super heavies are getting wounded on threes. It's AP minus four with ignore cover, which matches the Shadow Sword in many ways for its AP. And then it's a flat damage four per shot, which means with the volume, with the strength, with the AP, it's very easy for this vehicle to blow up any light, medium, and even some heavy vehicles as well. It's got everything that you need in a big gun, reliability, range and a fantastic strength ap and damage profile as well on top of this its ability armor obliteration is very anti-meta each time an attack made with this model's quake cannon destroys an enemy model that has the deadly demise ability that model's deadly demise ability inflicts mortal wounds on a d6 roll of a three plus instead of a six plus essentially you force monsters to go into death throws and you force vehicles to explode on a 3+. plus. Against the right kind of list, that's going to start causing a whole host of extra runes and it's just going to add on even more damage potential to the main gun. The only tiny caveat is that 
Of course, it only works against those models that do have Deadly Demise, so it is very slightly specialized, but like with the Shadow Sword, it's definitely anti-meta, but unlike the Shadow Sword, it's not useless into hordes. Honestly, the Bane Sword has everything you want in a Super Heavy, and it's well worth its 515 points. But there can only be one. One winner, one gold medalist, one unit that takes it all home. And who knew that it would be the Chode Cannon? Of course, I am talking about the Storm Sword. This unit kind of came out of nowhere. Honestly, it was a bit of a sleeper in ninth. A lot of people just dismissed it because it's not very well known. I don't think there's a huge amount of lore around the Storm Sword. A lot of the books that get written in Black Library tend to be about the Bane Blade or tend to be about the Shadow Sword. It's not quite as wacky as the Storm Lord. So, yeah, it's a bit of a weird one. But honestly, the Storm Sword has been solid for a while now. And so it's kind of deserves its place in the sun. And I'm happy to say that it is the top super heavy for the guard in 10th edition. Now, what has it done to deserve this moniker? Well, firstly, it's Storm Sword Siege Cannon. The biggie, right? The main weapon. It's blast and it ignores cover. It's got a 48 inch range. It fires D6 plus six shots. So again, all the things I just said about the Bane Swords Quake Cannon kind of apply here. It's got blast to help deal with hordes and it's got the range. That means it's great on being able to get the angles it needs and shoot. And it's got a really reliable number of shots. Well, even if you roll a one, you're looking at seven shots. It's then got the strength and the AP. It's also strength 16. It's also AP minus four but it's actually D6 plus two damage. Now, that's very spicy because it's average damage it's doing from each one of these shots is 5.5. That's five to six damage. So even though it's got a very, very similar profile to the Quake Cannon, it actually, on average, gets more damage done with each shot. I thought damage four was good. I was full massed at damage four, but average damage five or six, that's even better. On top of all of this, it's got a brilliant ability as well. The concussive wave. And yes, you have to say it like that every single time. In your shooting phase, just after selecting a target for this model, Storm Sword Siege Cannon, roll 1d6 for the target unit and every other unit within three inches of that unit. On a five plus, the unit being rolled for is struck by a concussive wave. After this model has finished making its attacks against that target unit this phase, each unit struck by a concussive wave suffers D3 mortal wounds. This is kind of like an alternative version of armor obliteration. Whereas armor obliteration does extra mortals on a three plus, it's only because it makes other units explode. If you shoot against infantry, they don't suffer the mortal wounds. The concussive wave is only on a five plus, but it's against any unit type and it does D3 mortal wounds as well. So I would say because it does it against any unit type, it means that it's less situational. And therefore, by definition, even though it doesn't go off as regularly, and even though the number of mortal wounds might be a bit less, it does do it in all battlefield situations. There's never going to be a game where the concussive wave doesn't go off. And so for that reason, the fact that it's got an ability that is always on, that just straight up does more damage, which is the whole point of these tanks. I keep saying, like, you're taking them to kill things. Any ability that increases your killing things is good. So not only has it got an ability that gets the main point across, it's also got a really, really good weapon, and that weapon does the most average damage consistently. So there's literally no downside to this thing. If you wanted to nitpick, you could say that at 520 points, it is pretty expensive, but it is not the most expensive variant out there. Of course, you have got the Bane Blade, which is 540 points. And when you compare the Storm Sword to the Bane Blade, you realize how overcosted the Bane Blade is. And it makes that Storm Sword just seem a little bit more appealing. But as always, all of this is just like my opinion, man. Let me know what you think down in the comment section below. 
Do you agree with my list or do you think there should be another super heavy that's on the top slot? Make sure that you smash that like button and of course subscribe to never miss an episode. Would you like to know more? If so, then please consider becoming a channel member or Patreon. By supporting the channel, not only will you be doing your part, but you'll also be helping me create more content for your viewing pleasure and unlocking a whole host of perks. You get everything from a badge next to your name, custom emojis, but the big one is access to the Mordian Glory Discord server, an online community with almost two and a half thousand active members. It's always popping off in the MG Discord. We've got channels for army lists, hobbying, tactics, stories, and even a pretty spicy meme section as well. For all you greenhorns that wanted to see the Mordian glory hole, today is your lucky day. And joking aside, I do want to say a massive thank you to all of the current channel members and patreons you guys are amazing truly the lifeblood of the channel i could not do more doing glory full-time without the incredible and generous support of my members so thank you guys so much and last but certainly not least i want to say a personal thank you to all of my top tier patrons these are the war masters the people who have truly gone above and beyond the call of duty so a massive thank you to bon bon vert ken star mark panconi rj scorpion swordfish trombone john stubbs nick walsh diesel fox and august varney thank you guys from the bottom of my heart you are incredible your generosity is truly humbling and i could just say it a thousand times over and over again thank you thank you Thank you. Hope you all enjoyed today's video. Thank you for watching. And of course, as always, I'll see you guys next time.